Good evening and welcome. First up, news from South Asia. It's Mehen in the Maldives. A day after President Abdullah Yami declared a state of emergency in the country, he remains defiant. Addressing the nation today, Yamin said the emergency decree is to investigate the plot of a coup from the Supreme Court ruling. A shock ruling from the court last week ordering the release of top opposition politicians has triggered a furious response from Yamin. He said the Supreme Court should not be subject to pressure from other state powers and that the president should have full authority including over the judiciary. Now, hours after declaring a state of emergency for 15 days, Yamin sent soldiers to storm the court and arrest judges, including Chief Justice Abdullah Saeed. The arrested judges were sent to a detention facility outside the capital, Malay. Now, the Maldives police also detained Yamin's estranged half-brother and former president Mamoun Abdul Gayoum, who had sided with the main opposition. Tension has gripped the capital, Mali, as opposition activists hit the streets protesting against the imposition of emergency. The United Nations and several countries have urged the Maldivian government to respect the court order. All eyes are now on Yamin's predecessor, Mohammed Nasheed, who remains in exile in Sri Lanka's capital of Colombo. Now, Nasheed uh, urged India to send its envoy, backed by military to secure the release of all political detainees and judges. He also asked the United States to stop all financial transactions of the Maldives regime, leaders going through U.S. banks as well. Now, earlier today, Nasheed tweeted to say, and I quote, On behalf of Maldivian people, we humbly request India to send envoy backed by its military to release judges and political detainees, including President Gayoum. We request a physical presence and the U.S. will stop all financial transactions of Maldives regime leaders going through U.S. banks, end quote. All right, joining me live from the Beyond newsroom now is Beyond Senior Foreign Editor Padma Rao. Good evening, Padma. Uh, now, we've heard world capitals react to the developments in the Maldives. What do you make of their reaction so far? Well, the reaction in, from Western countries has been, you know, quite predictable and justified, I would say. I mean, after all, the Maldives is a, a democracy. And right. uh, in democracies, the Supreme Court and the Chief Justice, uh, you know, and uh, all judicial proce processes must be uh, recognized and, and uh, adhered to, even by uh, an elected president. Now, in this case, President Yamin, as you know, came to power in a very controversial runoff vote, uh, which uh, dislodged the first democratically elected president of this country, Mohammed Nasheed, who is now in exile and who is leading a joint oppositional effort to oust President Yamin. So it's, it is rather, you know, disturbing and disconcerting. Uh, and just to add, India has also taken that position that uh, the judiciary must be respected and that democracy be restored. And, of course, uh, many countries have issued travel advisories. Now, uh, there is a peculiarity in all this. China has issued only a travel advisory, but it has not, uh, you know, gone uh, a step beyond as to uh, what, what President Yamin should do or not do. Uh, the, 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 the louder side if you like, in South Asia is from Pakistan. Now, remember, Pakistan is home to the second largest Muslim population. The Maldives is a Muslim country. In fact, they are the two, you know, sort of their allied their, uh, brothers, if you like, in religion. And, uh, and uh, it is surprising to see that Pakistan has not issued any form of a statement or a reaction uh, to the events in the Maldives. Uh, now, uh, the question, of course, remains, uh, you know, how President Yamin is interpreting a judicial uh, 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 judgment uh, by the Supreme Court, uh, uh, you know, the highest judicial instance of the country as a sort of a coup. Uh, you know, I think that's a classic case of a, a very, very charred pot calling right. uh, shiny kettle black. All right. Padma Rao, thank you for your inputs. That was beyond senior foreign editor Padma Rao with all the latest. All right. Now to the next story we are tracking here on We On Dispatch this evening. World stock markets today nosedived. Four trillion dollar investor wealth has been wiped off in just the past eight days when stocks were at a record high. Europe's stock exchanges started down as much as 3%, prompting investors to turn towards gold. The stock sell-off had been viewed by some as a healthy correction. Wall Street's Dow Jones and S&P 500 benchmarks had slumped 4.6% and 4.1% respectively yesterday, their biggest drop since August of 2011. It was also the Dow's biggest fall on a pure points basis of all time. 
In Asia, MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan slid 3.4%. Taiwan's main index lost 5%, its biggest since 2011. And Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index dropped 4.2%. Japan's Nikkei dived 4.7% as well to 4% lows, its worst fall since November of 2016. Now, the original trigger for the sell-off was a sharp rise in the U.S. bond yields late last week after data showed the U.S. wages increasing at the fastest pace since 2009. Now, that raised the alarm about higher inflation and, with it, potentially higher interest rates. In India, meanwhile, BSE Sensex ended 1.6 percent down at 34,195. Nifty 50 closed 1.58 percent lower at 10,498. All right. For more in the story, I'm now joined by Catherine Drew, a market expert, joining me live from London. Catherine, what do you make of this uh, free fall, so to speak, in world markets? Well, just a correction there. I'm a reporter. I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I have been uh, reading the comments and looking to see what everyone uh, is, is making of uh, this here in Europe. Of course, we're only just a couple of hours away from the uh, U.S. markets opening again. And uh, I think all eyes will be on there. As you mentioned, the big European indices in Paris, in Frankfurt, in Germany and here in London were down almost immediately, uh, three to three and a half percent. They have paired some of those gains at one point, they were down 1.8%, but they're now currently down about 2.5%. And what's interesting is those three indices are, are closely tracking each other. Obviously, investors waiting to see uh, what will happen. So the big talk here in London is whether this is just a technical correction, something that was overdue in, a, in an overbought uh, market, an overheated market, or whether this is uh, something deeper, an, an unwinding of sorts, uh, a return to volatility and uh, the marketplace really getting ready and, and adjusting itself to this end of um, uh, quantitative easing and those sort of uh, options that we've seen from central banks propping up and stimulating the economy. Right. Technical correction, says Catherine there, but also Catherine, very quickly, how do you see these developments pan out in the near term going forward? Well, Credit Suisse is warning of a few days of volatility. And let's remember, we haven't had a period of volatility either right. in London or in the U.S. for months. And uh, on, to on the back of President Donald Trump's tax cuts and uh, better uh, global economic indices, obviously we've had a, a smooth sailing. So I think people have forgotten how volatile the markets could be. I think this really is a waiting game. But in the immediate term, I think we will see some choppy trading. All right, Catherine Drew in London, thank you. Now, Vion is on ground zero exploring what it takes for Indian Army personnel to serve in a foreign land. Vion is the only channel covering the Indian peacekeeping troops in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And Vion's Karthike Sharma joined a UN peacekeeping force as it flew over dense jungles and lava fields to its forward bases in the Congo. Here's a report. So now I'm going to tell you something which is very interesting. Now what you see is not soil. This is lava. This volcano erupted 12 years back. Vegetation has come up. But all what you see is the volcanic soil. And the volcano which erupted from there, the right in front of you. So, Congo is full of active volcanoes and this is one part of its geography. The whole town of Goma got obliterated and it got obliterated because this lava is very fast moving and this lava actually acquired a speed of 60 kilometers per hour, traveled for more than 70 kilometers and destroyed hectares and hectares of land. And this lava came from Norimong volcano and now and this volcano is expected active again any time this year. So it has passed that day. But the fact of the matter is, it goes on to show how inhospitable this terrain has become and how inhospitable the terrain of Congo is. It is remote, it's unconnected with road, and most important of all, it makes job tough for the United Nations. 
And Karthikeya Sharma spoke to Major Pranay Kale during the chopper ride and asked him about the mission and its challenges. Listen in. So I am on my way to Rivindi. Rivindi is in Congo and you can see the helicopter is uh, taking a turn uh, towards its left and joined by uh, Major Pranay Kala who is part of the United Nations Peacekeeping Force. Uh, Pranay, how challenging, adventurous and difficult is the task of peacekeeper in uh, Congo? It is a very challenging and uh, difficult task per se, but the training that we get in our own army back in our country land, the experiences that we have makes it very easy for the Indian peacekeepers to operate and work in Congo under the United Nations. Of course, it has its own challenges of cultural differences, language barriers, the change in dynamics, the situation, and the political turmoil, the frequency with which the situation changes over here. But we are one of the best forces under the United Nations missions, which is doing a very, very good job, a remarkable job that we are doing and which is also widely recognized by the, uh, the locals over here as well. Uh, Pranay, you know, one thing I would like to ask you, how do you balance between the locals and the Congolese army? Because when it comes to uh, Congolese army, uh, they are not very professional and locals have their own expectations from uh, UN. So how do you balance those uh, counter aspirations, training the army and maintaining the interest of the local community? Well, it is a very challenging task per se, because as per the UN mandate, we are supposed to be helping the local army, the Congolese army with their training. We are also supposed to help them with a bit of operations per se. But, uh, you know, if we help them openly, then we also might be creating dissent among the local people. There might be armed groups which think that we are against them helping the local army, but then the, we have to strike a very fine balance where we have to respect the sentiments of the people, take care of the sentiments and at the same time help the Congolese army raise their standards so that they can take care of their own country themselves. But you know the bottom line here is, look at the remoteness of this area. You know Pranay, when, we, uh, when you operate here, when you come here, how does your uh, experience of the world, how does your experience of Indian military come to handy in Congo? Uh, in fact, uh, this question has been asked by a lot of uh, other nationals who are here under the UN flag with us. And I always tell them that the experience that we have in our country land, be it Kashmir, be it the North or the Northeast, comes in very handy because we've handled situations like this, we handle locals like this, the welfare measures that we do, the kind of operation that we're doing, the kind of recce mission that we're doing even now are similar to what we've done back in our country land. So we are amongst the most experienced people to be here in Congo under the United Nations. So you know, life is full of challenges and Major Pranay Kala is one of the faces of Indian military. He, like many others, symbolizes the exemplary vigor, professionalism and patriotism of Indian men or men and all is the true caps. The camera person Manish Shavastav Karthike Sharma from Congo for we all. Already in more news from India, two policemen died while a suspected terrorist managed to escape during a firing at a Srinagar hospital in India's Jammu and Kashmir state today. The uh, firing happened when the policemen were accompanying the Pakistani terrorist for a medical checkup. Reports say the terrorist snatched the rifle of the policeman accompanying him and opened fire. He then managed to escape. जेल से कुछ डेटी न्यूज़ आए थे। उसमें से एक ने वन है ट्राई टू स्नैच द वेपन। प्रॉब्लम उसने उसे फायर किया है। हमारी जो पार्टी है प्रोटेक्शन पार्टी, उसपे फायर किया है। दो उसमें एक क्रिटिकली इंजर्ड है और एक इंजर्ड है। तो एक वन डेटी ने हैस फ्लैड अवे रेस्ट फाइव। वी हैव जस्ट टेकन बैक � Right, joining me live is uh, Beyond's correspondent from Srinagar. Uh, good evening, Khalid. Uh, a terrorist escaped from police custody. Is it a case of a security lapse, conspiracy, collusion, or all of the above? 
Uh, good evening. Well, this does uh, definitely seem like a security lapse uh, because uh, the people, uh, the terrorist suspected militants who had come to uh, uh, to release this particular uh, terrorist, Navid, who was in the police custody, had pinpoint information of where he is going, what time he's going to be in the hospital. They even had a full information of from uh, the exit routes that they have to take. Uh, what we have learned from police sources so far is that at least one to two people uh, went inside the OPD, a number 15. 15 of the hospital where these uh, terrorists were, uh, where this uh, 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 incarcerated terrorist was brought uh, for medical checkup. He was there with uh, other six detainees. Uh, they pinpointed this person and shot at the two guards who were escorting him and then uh, make sure, made sure that he uh, flies away with them. Uh, this is clearly a big security lapse as far as the security uh, forces are concerned because how did uh, such a operation got planned when this person was inside the jail? How did the uh, the two boys who came from outside the two militants uh, to make sure that he's released uh, know the knew the exact details of where he's going to be and what time he's going to be in the hospital? So clearly, big questions as far as this is concerned. In this tragic incident, two of the cops of Jammu and Kashmir Police lost their life. Uh, we are being told by the eyewitness out there that they fought very hard uh, to keep him under their own custody and perhaps uh, that's why uh, the second cop uh, received a bullet injury in his abdomen. Uh, clearly a case of security lapse as far as Jammu and Kashmir police is concerned because this was a high profile terrorist who was involved right. in killing of at least seven police four policemen in past. He was arrested in 2014. He was believed to be a close aide of uh, ex Lashkar commander Abu Qasim. Remember Abu Qasim uh, in itself is a dreaded name as far as terror in Kashmir is concerned. And this particular right. terrorist who was Naveed. Uh, Abu Hanzala is his alias who was fled away from the scene. We don't know, we don't have any input as far as uh, where he has gone, whether he's joined back uh, to the Lashkar Kader or uh, will he be exfiltrating to the Pakistan uh, area. That's not known as yet, but police has now launched a cordon uh, and search operation. They are searching for him throughout the valley. A high alert has been issued right. uh, throughout Srinagar city and police is now wanting to nab him as soon as possible. Also, very quickly, Khalid, how has the government reacted to this development? Uh, what is the police saying about this uh, unfortunate case? Uh, well, the government, uh, as far as Chief Minister is concerned, she has uh, condemned this event. She has also condoled with the families who lost uh, of the cops who lost their life. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is some sort of a criticism coming in from various quarters saying that as to why uh, such security lapses took place. Right. On the other hand, which is pertinent to mention out here, the other cops who were in and around that area for the duty man maintained maximum restraint and didn't fire back. Indeed, they did save a lot of lives inside the a lot of civilian lives inside the hospital by maintaining restraint and uh, really not uh, going into an encounter situation inside the hospital. On that note, Khalid Shah, thank you for your inputs. All right, now to another story we are tracking here on We On Dispatch this evening. A bill was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives to put an end to non-defense aid to Pakistan. The bill was introduced by two lawmakers. They have called on the Trump administration to redirect aid funds to infrastructure development in the country. The bill calls out Pakistan for providing military aid and intelligence to terrorists. Now, Congressman Mark Sanford and Thomas Massey from Kentucky have introduced the bill in the House of Representatives. In a statement, Sanford said, when the American people support other nations, our generosity should not be used to reward terrorists with U.S. taxpayer dollars, end quote. And we have made clear to Pakistan that while we desire continued partnership, we must see the same. All right, going back to the story we are tracking here on uh, We On All Day Long, it's from the Maldives where it's mayhem in the country. Now, a day after President Abdullah Yamin declared a state of emergency in the country, he remains defiant. Addressing the nation today, Yamin said the emergency decree is to investigate the plot of a coup from the Supreme Court ruling. A shock ruling from the court last week ordering the release of top opposition politicians has triggered a furious response from Yamin. He said the Supreme Court should not be subject to pressure from other state powers and that the president should have full authority including over the judiciary. 
Now, hours after declaring a state of emergency for 15 days, Yamin sent soldiers to storm the court and arrest judges, including, by the way, Chief Justice Abdullah Saeed. The arrested judges were sent to a detention facility outside the capital, Malay. The Maldives police also detained Yamin's estranged half-brother and former President Mamun Abdul Gayoom, who had sided with the main opposition. Tension, meanwhile, has gripped capital Malay as opposition activists hit the streets, protesting against the imposition of the emergency. Meanwhile, the United Nations and several countries have urged the Maldivian government to respect the court order. All eyes now are on Yamin's predecessor, Mohammad Nasheed. All right, I'm now joined by journalist uh, Aishwet Shani from uh, Rajay TV from uh, Mali, the capital of Maldives. Good evening to you. First of all, uh, put things into context, what all happened since last night when Gayoom Sr. was arrested? Well, Gai Ma, the former president, Mamun Abdul Gayoom, was arrested, as we all saw. And the, right. his half-brother, who is the president right now, he spoke to the nation earlier today. He addressed the nation, and we have to point out that he did not even mention anything about the, his his brother's arrest at all in his speech. This was not mentioned at all. But he did mention that even a former president can be arrested. That action that action can be taken against right. him as well someday. But there are already some allegations, a lot of allegations against the president, President Yam, and like corruption allegations. But we're not seeing if anyone is trying to take any action or trying to bring him, um, make him responsible or accountable. He's um, suppressing those things. He's making right. in the um, making the work stop. Like in much much this, if you. Um, think about the people's much list. They're not able to hold any sessions right now. Ever since he, ever since they started, they trying to. Um, they filed a motion against the speaker. Right. The majlis have been at has been at a halt. Now that the Supreme Court released this order in uh, last Thursday, the the state of emergency was declared last night. In right. a way that the the Supreme Court loses their powers. I should, but tell me something. Uh... Uh, I'm just curious to know what happens after the end of the 15-day period. How do you think the constitutional impasse will be broken or will it persist going forward as well? The f well, 15 days is a long time. The, the president, if he wanted to, he could um, extend the state of emergency. But okay. he has also said that, you know, like in other countries, that there's no chaos. So it's not that there's chaos in the country. It's just that um, there's... He had not been able to contact the Chief Justice or um, Justice Ali Hamid. This is why he had to declare a state of emergency. He had not been able to hold the Supreme Court judges um, accountable. Right. This is why the state of emergency was declared. Right. This is the reason. I should uh, also very quickly, uh, you know, there are very many actors in Maldives today, be it the, the judiciary, the executive, the opposition, the police, the military. Now, where does President Yamin draw his power from? Is it the military? If so, how is the military shaping up uh, as we speak? Well, the defense minister, um, Adam Sharif, did give an interview to the state media afterwards, after the president's speech, and he spoke about this. Um, the military is obviously with the president. They've already said that they will follow all the advice in the matter, which is why they they have been seen. The security forces have been seen active in um, arresting right. Mamun Abdul Gayoom or any other officials. They were active outside and inside Supreme Court. Some officers were on the roof trying to enter the Supreme Court last night, and some of. Um, as you know, the Supreme Court ruling had ordered the release of nine high-profile prisoners, including Nashi, then former Defense Minister Nazim, and Faris Mamun, the Igaro constituency MP Faris Mamun. Now, Faris was released today. His father was arrested just last night, which is former President Mamun Abdul Gayoom. Nazim, who was under house arrest, was taken back to back into police custody today. All right. On that note, Aishish Shani, thank you so much for inputs uh, live from Malay in the Maldives. All right, with that, it's a wrap on Weon Dispatch. But news continues here on Weon. You can catch all the latest updates on our social media, mobile and digital platforms. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.